everyone. I want to thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Linda Macaron. I am the uh, office manager here at St. Therese. And before we get started, I'd like to have Father Larry come up and offer a prayer for this meeting. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for the beautiful sunshine, and for gathering us together. We thank you for all the people who work in the kitchen. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit to guide us as we learn what is required of us so that everyone may be safe and healthy. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Again, thanks all of you for coming today. I didn't quite know how many people we would expect or not, but it just goes to show how many volunteers we have here in various organizations in the parish. And part of the reason we wanted to do this is, um, I'm going to assume many of you know this, but maybe some don't, that our kitchen is required, it falls in the same category as a restaurant. We have to have, uh, health inspections and follow a lot of the same policies and regulations that restaurants need to follow. So we have some big events here. We feed a lot of people and we don't want anyone to get sick. So Karen um, Bosca here is from the health department and she's, are you our only inspector? Yes. She inspects us and she doesn't really give us any notice. She just happens to show up usually on a Friday when we have a fish fry or something going on <laughs> and we're all in a panic oh no um, but one of the requirements that we also have because we are a license we have to be licensed by the state uh, we also have to have a food a certified food operator safety manager whatever and Tim or Becky who's on our maintenance staff part-time, has gone through the class and is certified. Um, many of you know Paul Miani. Paul is um, from Zio's Catering and does a lot of the events that we have here, and he's also certified. For those of you who don't know, Bill Scally is our facilities manager, and he's in charge of the maintenance staff and making sure everything runs smoothly here in regards to the facilities. And Lisa Lombardo um, is on our maintenance staff, and she, her main responsibility is keeping the kitchen and the social hall clean and uh, ready for the different events that we have here. Lisa also works with Utica Schools in their, um, and is well aware of the, what the public schools require for food safety and handling as well. So um, we're much more informed than what we used to be, with everything that's going on in our world, crazy world today, um, the archdiocese and our insurance carrier, our risk management people, want to make sure that we're doing everything possible to keep you and our guests safe here when we have events. So we thought, well, let's get everybody on the same page, because if we did a handout, probably most people wouldn't read it. And uh, so we thought, well, let's bring everyone together. Hopefully different things will stick in different people's minds. And um, we will probably try to write down some of the key things that we feel is important and keep um, some things in, in the social hall. Um, one of the things that you may have noticed that we put up a sign in the kitchen saying that it's going to be locked um, for safety reasons. And part of that is a couple weeks ago, I came in on a Saturday. No one else was in the building, but it was open. And I see this guy walking out of the kitchen who really had no business being there. Um, I know who he is, but he's not really a parishioner. He's just kind of one of those people that's often around. And um, we have a lot of expensive equipment in our kitchen. And a lot of times people drop off food. And wouldn't it be awful if someone came in out of mean-spiritedness, craziness, whatever the issues, and contaminated the food that would make everyone who attends an event sick? So those are the types of reasons why we've chosen to try and keep the kitchen locked when it's not in use. It's not to say anyone can't come in, hopefully us on staff or the maintenance staff, if you need to get into the kitchen, honestly right now the swing door isn't locked, <laughs> so you can come in this way, but uh, 
as an example, we have a lot of people walking in and through the church, and, and we don't always know who's here. We want them to come and pray, and we want to be welcoming, but we also don't want to put anyone in a situation where there would cause anyone danger. So um, with that, I am going to start with Karen and have her talk about some of the issues that are common, safety issues that uh, we need to be concerned with. And I don't want to insult anyone and think that, oh, we know that. We, should, we all should know we should wash our hands. Well, I can tell you many times I've heard people come out of the bathroom, bathroom and our blowers are really loud. You know when someone does or doesn't wash their hands. So I don't want to insult anyone, but there are a lot of practical things that people just don't think about. We're not at home. Um, we're serving the public. So um, hopefully we'll gain at least some insight and be a little bit more careful about some of the practices that we have here. So with that, Karen. Well, welcome, everybody. Hello. Big group today. So. Thanks all for coming. Um, I am Karen Bosca. I've been with the health department for almost 13 years now. Can you guys hear this back there at all? Okay. Um, I've been with the health department for 13 years. Um, I've been in the food service industry for 25 years, and I still actually work in a restaurant. I waitress and bartend part-time as well, too. So I know both sides, the ins and outs. So I know the practicality of it all, and I know the laws of it all. So kind of mingling those two, I can guarantee you, is difficult at times when you're working in a kitchen and you're trying to follow all these regulations. Um, as Linda stated too, there's a serve safe manager class. Um, every restaurant, closer, sorry. I don't wanna blow you guys out either because I do have a loud voice at times. So um, the serve safe manager course is required for any licensed kitchen at all. Um, and I've actually taught that class for many years. Um, the county no longer offers it or provides it to restaurants. So everyone has to do it on their own now, but we did use to provide as a service. So I've been, like I said, all around the law, in and out, working it, enforcing it so I've kind of got a little ins and outs um, we're gonna cover some basics and I'm not gonna overwhelm you with a 200 page food code or the food law because I don't even like reading it let alone trying to tell yeah this is just a mere this is the class part of the class course book here that's a mere glimpse of what we look at too so um, I also recommend questions if you have questions please go ahead raise your hand we'll do them we'll, we'll address them as we go because it's better to stay with the topic that we're at instead of backtracking um, and yes, and also, correct, Linda, also too, we don't have to imply, or imply some of the laws here. You are a certified kitchen. You are like a big boy. You are like a Burger King. You are like any type of banquet facility. You are equated to any other certified or registered restaurant. It is the exact same law. Everything applies to you guys here. So even though you do minimal service just for meetings or um, um, awake or something of that nature, every single law and safety does have to be taken. And as you even know, even in the industrial side of it, how many recalls have we had on spinach lately? Tomatoes. It's followed every step of the way. And these practices, which are followed all the way from the industrial, the agriculture, through the Kroger's, to here, to Gordon Foods, are all the same requirements that they actually have to follow. And that's where the checks and balances come in and how we get these food recalls. We do investigations, find out where the problem was, and have them fix those measures so that doesn't happen again. Does anybody have any questions? Yep, right ahead. There are other classes, actually, and Linda will have my information. You can call the health department, and we actually have a list of approved um, courses. Um, Macomb does offer a class right now. There is a continuing ed class at Macomb, but there's also a four-credit class for the culinary, culinary students. So there's a semester course, so unless you want to do it for credit. Otherwise, I would do the continuing ed. It's a little bit cheaper. But there's also online versions and independent companies that also will do the um, testing for you as well, the training and testing as well, too. And if you had a certification before and you were thinking about renewing it, if you used to have a restaurant job or you work in a restaurant part-time, they've just updated the food code as well as of October 1st of last year. So there are some tweaks and changes to it. So if you're going to take a class, make sure that you take the full class or at least a refresher if you've had it first. Don't just, because you can take a retest and just update your certificate. I don't recommend that because there have been some changes to the food code. All right, with that in mind, we'll get into some basic hygiene and cooking things. Um, the first and foremost thing is my favorite thing I always tell people in class. The one thing I want you to remember when leaving is about washing hands. 
Washing hands, as silly as it sounds, is one of the biggest sources of contaminations for food because people don't properly wash their hands. And just to be honest with you, we have people at our work, I don't hear that blower going for either, it's just so you know. It's not just here. There are some people that think if you don't go to, if you don't have your nation on your hands that you don't have to wash your hands, but we all know that that really shouldn't be. Washing your hands when you leave a restroom is very important. For example, I'll give you a clue. We see many, 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 many bad things. I could tell you many bad stories. One of them being that my boss went in after they impl implemented the glove rule where you can't touch a bare, your bare hands to a food that's ready to eat, so you have to wear gloves. Saw one of the young cooks coming out of the kitchen, or I'm sorry, out of the bathroom with his gloves on. So these are things that we run into. So these are the, these are the educations that we provide because as common sense as it may sound that you should take your gloves off before going to the bathroom, some people think it's an antibacterial glove that you can touch anything with. So these are, the, these are things. So even basic hygiene becomes something very critical because it can um, promote passing of different bacteria and viruses. And some of them, like the hepatitis B, is actually fecal oral contamination. Fecal meaning feces, oral meaning mouth. So that means somebody went to the bathroom, touched your food, and you ate it. And that's how you got hepatitis, uh, possibly. It's a foodborne illness. And that's how it spreads. So these are things that we worry about. And that's why, the, I know it sounds very gross. Think of all the classes I had to go hear about that. So as much as basic hygiene sounds like it's such a simple thing, it's about actually doing it properly. And it's every time. We got people that do this, people that do this, people that people that pick at their faces, and then handle food. Yeah, I know. You guys remember the Dirty Dozen? Remember they used to do the Dirty Dozen on TV, which they don't do anymore. They used to be the 12 worst restaurants in Macomb County, wasn't it? A lot of unhappy restaurants on that one, let me tell you. But they needed it almost. They did stop doing that because they changed the reporting procedures so that people would look at all critic or all violations, not just the most important like hand washing or anything, because there is a broad basis of violations that add to and can compound into a critical violation. So hand washing is important. And yes. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. Right. Nope. Correct. A fresh, a fresh set. I always recommend people do that. So for hand washing, anytime you do anything other than touching what you're touching, wash your hands. Anytime you change the practice that you're doing at that time, so say you're working with a salad or sandwiches or cutting or prepping or cooking, if you're doing something or you're going from a raw meat to a ready to eat meat, wash your hands. You go to the bathroom, wash your hands. You sneeze, wash your hands. Just when in doubt, wash your hands. And hand sanitizer, I'm, I'm getting, I'm gonna add into the gloves here in just a second. Hand sanitizer does not replace hand washing, just so you know. Think of dipping your hand into a pot of, of mud when you come out. You can put hand sanitizer on that afterwards. What, what good did it do you? None, because the mud's still there. So you actually have to physically remove any, and you can't see bacteria and germs, so that's where the hand washing is the important part because you can't see it, but you can't properly sanitize a hand that has materials of food and grime and stuff left behind. You can't sanitize it if the physical debris is still there. Yeah. Yes. Um, that was about singing happy birthday when you wash your hands. That's called the 20 second rule, actually, that we have. They refer to it as the 20 second rule. And the reason they say sing happy birthday or do the alphabet that gets you in, because you think you wash your hands forever or you don't want to leave them in. I get um, eczema really bad, so working at a restaurant and inspecting restaurants, it flares up, especially wintertime, really bad. But guess what? I have to do it because it prevents me from bringing the bacteria into a restaurant as well, too, when I do an inspection. So singing happy birthday or doing the alphabet gives you that amount of time. They're saying about 20 seconds should be enough to do your full hand. And we're not talking about talking about washing your hands in between your fingers, around fingernails, things of that nature. So, so it's, it's not, not just about the palms of your hands because contamination comes from everywhere. 
fake nails. You do have to be cautious. If you're having fake nails, you shouldn't be having contact with foods at all because there was quite a few years ago babies in the neonatal unit, I'm sure some of you probably remember this, that were dying and they could not figure out why they kept getting this bacteria in the neonatal unit. It was the nurse's nails that were contaminating the kids and they were dying because there was a bacteria that was under the fillings of the nails and they couldn't figure out why it was happening and many children died in that hospital. So that's where they correlated that. So there's reasons why fingernails, backs of hands, in between fingers is very important. And, if, and that's for touching things that are not ready for the customer to eat. Once it's ready to be in the person's mouth, so if it's a salad, it's always ready to eat because you don't cook the salad. Deli meats, cheeses, things of that nature, that's going to be ready to consume once you open it and put it on a plate for somebody. But something that you're preparing and gonna cook, dried pasta, um, a pizza, let's say, a roast, one, you can touch it raw all you want, but you wanna make sure that your hands have been washed and that they're washed after you touch the food because you don't want to take that food juice from that meat and touch a door to open up the refrigerator, to open up a drawer, or touching the salad or lettuce because now those aren't going to be um, cooked at all and now you have beef juice on lettuce. So that's called cross-contamination in that way. So raw foods that aren't going to be eaten that way can be touched with your bare hands once they've been properly washed. But going to the glove rule, once, Once it's, it's ready, ready for, for someone, someone to eat, gloves is just one way of not making contact with the food. You can use deli, whack, the deli papers, those wax papers. You can use tongs, you can use ladles. It depends on what the food is. So for example, you're serving soup, you don't need gloves. You're gonna, not gonna touch soup with your bare hands. So a ladle is considered the barrier between your hands and the food product. Um, if you're touching a sandwich, obviously that's when you're going to want to wear gloves. You've got the bread, you've got the lettuce, you've got the deli meat, you've got the cheeses. Anything you're assembling in that manner, you're going to want to wear gloves at that point. If you want to do something where you're cooking and baking or you're doing multiple things at once, I tell people put a glove on one hand and then you could put the ladle or the hot pad, pad in your other hand if you need to. If you're doing something like you have to pull the this isn't a good example because I know you guys got a lot of stuff in, but say you're doing toast. You really want to pull the toast out of the toaster because you can't touch it with your bare hand. And then you got to put butter on it so you have your hand free so you can use the spatula or the butter brush, let's say. Something along that line. So you don't want to have your hands always occupied with a glove. There's options that you can go around that. You just want to make sure once it's ready for someone to eat, you're not touching it with your bare hands. Ice. Ice is considered a food. Use a scoop. So things that you don't, if it's going in a person's mouth or it can be consumed, it's a food. So that's anything in that manner. So just basic hygiene. Like I said, I know it seems simple, but it gets lost really easy because we're in a hurry and things of that nature. Um, not only with the gloves is that, as I said too, they are not an ultimate barrier. If you contaminate your gloves, it's the same as contaminating your hands. So if you've worn them for a long period of time, you should remove, even if you're doing the same job, take them off and put a new set on because bacteria starts growing within four hours. After four hours, it grows exponentially, which means it just blossoms. And so bacteria at that temperature and time just start going faster and faster, and then you have tons of bacteria covering the surface of your gloves. Or if you touch something raw and you happen to have gloves on, you forgot you don't want to take that and move it over there. So you want to make sure that your gloves are not this mystical thing that can prevent bacteria. And people forget when you have gloves on because your hands don't feel slimy or greasy or anything. So that's that kid coming out of the bathroom. He's like, oh, I got clean gloves on. I'm good. So you want to make sure that your gloves are just as possible sources of contamination as your hands are if you don't use them properly. So if they rip, they tear, throw them out, get a new pair. And technically, you're supposed to wash your hands before you put those new gloves on. Because if your glove is contaminated and you go to take it off, your finger that had the glove on it just contaminated the inside of your hand. And you don't want to contaminate your new gloves as you put them on, so you're supposed to wash your hands again with the 20 second rule before you put those new gloves on. Because you want to make sure you're not carrying it over to your new fresh gloves. See, just different levels at which you can do the contamination. You want to just make sure that you're pinpointing all these, keep them in mind. 
Like I said, because you're in a hurry, got to grab something from the refrigerator. Oh, I got to get a spoon over here. I got to think of all those handles you just touched that is going to be touched by somebody else before they handle some food. So keeping those in mind, it, it goes fast. Think of in your own home, making dinner. I do this. I know. I do it in my home all the time. I look back and I'm like, how the heck did that get on the refrigerator door? It's wiping it off. Found it with me, my husband, or my kids, but it gets all over and then you pick it up from there and you're bringing it someplace else. And unfortunately, what we do in our own home, we can't do in a restaurant because um, we can't do in our own home that we can't do in a restaurant because we share germs. I can give Linda a bad cold right now because her and I don't share the same kind of germs. What she has in her house with her family are her germs. I have my own germs with my own family. You kind of live in a bubble. And once you get exposed, we always talk about, you know, the kids, you got kids or grandkids that come over. They bring all those germs from those other kids back home to you, don't they? Because there are different germs that are spreading around and they pass them from the next person to the next person. So what we do in our home are not the same practices that we can do in the kitchen. We have to take an extra step of precaution because we're giving them a different packet of germs to get into their body. So just making sure that we have good hygiene in that manner. Yes. I really hate that. I also hate it when I go to the movie theater and I have to get them out of the dispenser, the straws out of the dispenser. There is not a good way. Technically, they should, you know, if you're going to do it that way, there's not really a good dispensing method for stirrers, and I completely agree. I have my husband and I talk about this every time we go out to eat or to, or you go to Speedway and make your own coffee and you get the stirrer strips. There's not a good way to dispense them, unfortunately, unless you had everyone wash their hands before they came up. Don't use one. <laughs> But there, unfortunately, there's not a good, she was asking about the coffee stirs when you get a coffee, they're in a cup and there's a, about 50 of them in there. Well, someone's mingled in them as they grab their own. And unfortunately, that is a source of contamination. That's cro so if that person had germs on their hands, they've now put it on the other stirs. So unfortunately, there's not a good way to dispense coffee stirs. For example, on silverware, we put it so all the handles are sticking up. So we, for example, if you have a, a bucket this way instead of one that they're all laying down, we want the handles presented so you're grabbing the handle and not the food service part. So, but that's actually a good example of how cross-contamination can just happen that easily. That you could get a cold from somebody just grabbing your straw in accident and giving your germs on that. So, thinking of these things and just trying to be conscious of them as you're doing them. So, you can know in your own mind that you washed your hands when you put, if you grabbed a stir, so you know you didn't contaminate them, but you don't know if anybody else has them either, so just keeping those things in mind ahead of time, unless you want to separate them all out and do something like that. But unfortunately, there's not a great way to dispense those at this time. Um, another thing I want to talk about is cleaning and sanitizing. Sanitizing is required for any food contact surface and or countertop. Washing with just plain soap and water is not acceptable. Because you actually want, so washing actually just removes the, vi the visible debris or non-visible debris, just taking that off. The sanitizing, which is an approved amount of sanitizer, whether it's chlorine or ammonia, at a perfect concentration, that actually will eliminate or minimize to a great amount, to almost zero, the amount of bacteria that, or viruses that are present on that surface because we don't want them to carry over. There was a, don't want to name the place, a bakery many years ago that had a huge outbreak from many different parties because, and it was found that it was their food, because somebody didn't sanitize, they used the same filling for all these different desserts. But the thing is, is they were doing it all day and that four hours had passed. And they kept putting this custard mix back in, used it, put a new batch in, mixed it, put a new batch in, mixed it. Well, what happened? Bacteria got in every one of those desserts. Many, many, many people got sick. Many people got sick. There was a, one was a baby shower. The pregnant woman got sick and was hospitalized. And guess what? We got calls from the public yelling at us because we investigated them, which we were required to do. And guess what? It is a, and this was a rep, this is still a reputable company. It's been around for 35, 40 years. And they actually do very good at inspections. One mistake could have killed somebody because they were in a hurry. That's what happens. 
I mean, even the best intentions sometimes lead to a very deadly mistake, and they're lucky that no one died. But it could have very well, because a pregnant woman is what we call a highly susceptible population. Anyone under the age of five, elderly people, pregnant women, or people that are on certain medications, have cancer, or otherwise have compromised immune systems, can die like that from something as simple as salmonella. Most of us would just have diarrhea and some vomiting for a couple days where it could kill somebody else. So something as simple as forgetting to wash and rinsing and sanitizing, or instead of just rinsing out the bowl between uses, played it almost a deadly factor in this case. Thankfully, it was a good outcome. But you've already heard about the spinach recalls, the tomato recalls, people that were hospitalized, a couple people died over the years. And that's because certain safety precautions were not taken. And sanitizing is one of those safety precautions. You want to make sure that those dishes are washed in a soapy mixture. They have to be rinsed with clear water, and that actually gets the soap off the, the utensil or equipment because that soap will make the sanitizer not work. So that's why you have a rinse time in between there. So you want to wash it with a good soapy water, warm soapy water, rinse it off as best you can, and then you let it soak inside the sanitized compartment for about 10 to 60 seconds, depending on what kind of sanitizer you use. And that actually will kill the bacteria to where it's safely. And you've done everything that you possibly can besides flaming it and sterilizing it that way, which we don't do. <laughs> yep. Unfortunately, that's where you guys come into a problem in that manner. He was asking about the spinach salads because a lot of it comes in where we all run into that problem too is why those people got sick from the spinach is because it comes in pre-washed, ready to eat. You should wash it, but there's still no way to sanitize it in case there's bacteria and there's just no way. Even the water isn't going to do nothing but maybe move the bacteria from this lettuce piece of spinach to this piece of spinach. But yeah, you can't lie solid. But um, so you, uh, you have to rely on the chain of command at that point, which you guys are one of the last steps in that chain of command. If you're serving a salad with a spinach salad, like he asked, you're hoping that the production from the agricultural farmer to the processing plant that put it in the bag and washed it already and packaged it, you're hoping that they did all the steps that they were doing at that point. At that point, you're not liable, but it doesn't do you any good because someone gets sick from your place. And that's actually how we track, not we, but the FDA tracked the spinach to those particular farms because the restaurants and Kroger's and whoever else was selling them were able to say, this is the brand, and this is the bag, and this is the farm it came from, and they were able to narrow it down to two specific farms at that time. Again, it doesn't do you any good or your customers any good, but that's why you have to make sure that your part in that chain of command is as best as you can make possible. And no one's perfect. I'm not perfect. I screw up at work all the time. I miss things on inspection sometimes. I'm human. I won't say all the time, okay? I'm not all the time, but uh, as I tell my husband, I'm not 100% correct, but 99% go with the odds. So, but we do fail. We're humans. But trying to correct those and learning from our mistakes is really what's important and trying to do our best and being conscious about our part in this is really what comes down to. There are spray things that are acceptable. You can either have those Lysol wipes or any other brand. I can't recommend Lysol per se. But anyhow, a sanitizing wipe are approved for con as long as it has an EPA registration number or it has, um, it'll say on the back of the directions that it's for food contact surfaces, then you can use it for that. There's also a quaternary ammonia solution Okay, you guys, they have quaternary ammonia in the kitchen, so it's a concentration of that sanitizer with water. So you can take a soapy rag, wipe it down, take a clean rag, wipe it down, and then sanitize it. If you're coming in for the day and no one's been working on it, you can just go over and sanitize it because, in theory, there should be no food on it. But if you've been prepping and working on it all day, I would wash it, then sanitize it in that manner. That is also acceptable. You can do that in your home. The only reason I said quaternary ammonia is because they said they use it here. But 
chlorine bleach unscented and actually there is a difference on bleach so make sure you look on the back of the bleach that says for kitchens or for food contact and porous surfaces because there are some bleaches if you look at the back of them that will say for laundry and bathrooms only it's a different concentration of the sodium hypochlorite in there that you can't use on a food contact surface. It's the chemical that makes chlorine bleach, chlorine bleach. There's a different concentration and where they ship it in from, from China or someplace else, how they pack it. So they are very particular to make sure that it says for food contact surfaces right on the directions on the back. Again, not promoting Clorox, Clorox is. I can't, I can't promote Clorox, Clorox but Clorox, Clorox is guaranteed. It, is, it, it does, does have it right on the back. But you can't use the scented Clorox. Clorox actually you can use for laundry and for sanitizing food contact surfaces. surfaces. Some are both. But, but some, some will just say laundry and bathrooms. Some, some of them will say laundry, bathrooms, kitchen surfaces. And it actually tells you the concentrations of that level. Like for your laundry, they'll say a cap full per load. Um, for your kitchen, I'll say one cap per one gallon of water will give you 100 parts per million of chlorine sanitizer. So it really goes on what brand you buy, and it, will, it should tell you right on the back. It will have a chart on how much you should mix, and it'll tell you for what kind of surface. If you're disinfecting a toilet, if you're washing your laundry, or if you're doing a, a, something in the kitchen. Dawn just soap? That is not a sanitizer, it's a detergent. And Antibacterial is not a sanitizer, though, because it doesn't kill viruses. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not a food contact surface, and it's just a serving area. No, it is. I understand completely. Well, you shouldn't put your, yeah, that's a side note. Don't let your food touch the table and eat it because you don't know how well they wipe those tables off. Oh, your yes. Wash your hands before you eat your food. I <laughs> there are, and, and at that point you have, you so don't touch your food, use a fork. <laughs> so unfortunately there is, there's always a source of contamination but yes, exactly. How they wipe the table sometimes could end up being a source of contamination depending on what's left on it. How many times have you gone up the table dirty like, oh, gross. Can you wipe this down for me? And then just kind of slop some stuff on it. It could be, and there's no requirement because it's not part of the food serve. Pretty much anything in the kitchen, or in the kitchen we have waitress services, waitress service areas we have, self-serve areas we have. Anything in the dining part, we have no jurisdiction over because there's no food preparation or storage in the food service or the food where you sit, basically. We have no jurisdiction over that because there's no food being served or prepared there, no food being cooked there. Unless you're at like um, the Japanese, yeah, the, the, where they cook it right at the table for you. I saw, yes. I don't know the requirements, but they do tell you not to use certain cleaners and stuff on there. She was asking about the um, granite and uh, Corian countertops, if you have to use a certain sanitizer. We don't have a, um, we don't have, we, our requirement is iodine, quaternary ammonia, and chlorine sanitizer. Those are the only approved sanitizers in a kitchen that you can use in a commercial kitchen. And I know they have certain requirements of things you can and cannot use on corian and granite, so, and I don't know what those are. All I know is that they have to be one of those three types of sanitizers in a commercial kitchen, which this is considered a commercial kitchen. Now, if it starts breaking down, for example, a wood chopping block is approved for a chopping block, but those over time will start splitting and things like that. When it becomes in poor repair, like a granite countertop may become if you use the wrong sanitizer, we would require you to resurface it at that time. That's how we cover that. So if we see it's becoming pitted or the, the finish is coming off, because I think they do, a, do they seal the granite ones? So they might have to come and reseal it for you. If, but I would talk to the manufacturer to see which of those three products would be the best to use on that. And if there's a safer concentration, for example, chlorine for sanitizing can start at 50 parts per million. 
Well, if 50 is okay, you don't want to be putting 200 parts per million on the granite countertops because the 200 might be too corrosive and start eating that adhesive or the sealant on top. But at 50, it's an okay level. So that's where you want to talk to maybe a representative that deals with countertops and things of that nature. Yes. You unfor changing them, unfortunately, is what it comes down to. If you can't wipe them, and there's really nothing because they're absorbent and they've now come down to the fact that they've absorbed that food. Again, since it's the, well, then you can wipe it down with a wet washcloth. Because it's the eating area, we would have no jurisdiction over it, but for your, for your customers, I'm sorry, did everyone hear that about the countertop, about the, they want to know about how to wipe down the vinyl tablecloths? in between uses for the fish fries, just taking a soapy rag would be sufficient because it's not a food area per se. Yes. No, they are not approved for food contact. It is mostly just for um, non-food contact surfaces, toilets, floors, air, I, I don't know if I'm understanding. You mean the one that I'm talking about? Or just the, like a light cell are you talking about? Yes, that is, the quaternary ammonia is approved for countertops. It should be at a level that is approved oh, for the pots of paint. Yes, you, that's what you also sanitize with too. So if it's the same concentration and it's the same sanitizer that you would use in your three compartment sink for that wash, that rinse and that sanitized compartment, it should all, it air dries. You don't rinse it after sanitizing it. You could technically. I don't recommend it because the spray does not cover as well as the immersion. He was asking for wash, rinse, and sanitize is how you do a three compartment sink for washing. We talked about the visible detergent washing, rinsing off the soap, and then having a sanitized compartment. You could technically spray them, but what happens with the spray is you don't have an even distribution on the equipment, especially like a pot where it's gonna start dripping and getting in the inside of it because the spray di disperses, it's more concentrated in the center and it's lighter on the outside of the spray. And when you immerse, immerse it into a sanitized compartment of water, a sanitized, the third compartment of your sink, it actually sits in there because you have to let it sit from anywhere between 10 seconds and 90 seconds, depending on the sanitizer, which again, it will tell you in the back of the product. So soaking it and letting it sit for that time would be better than spraying it. You could technically, but you do want to be cautious because you may not get the whole surface of the equipment. After it's been in that, immersing for 10 to 90 seconds, depending on it, you pull it out, flip, if it's a pot, you flip it over so it can drip dry, and then you just let it air dry. Once it's air dried, it's approved to be used again. And the reason that that sanitizer is allowed to be on there is because it's in an approved amount for safety according to the FDA. So that's why we say, 50 parts per million to 200 parts per million. Or for quaternary ammonia, it's 150 parts per million, which is the basic least amount to uh, kill bacteria, to 300 parts per million, because you want to make sure it's at a safe level as well, too. So at those levels, and following the specs, on, and it really, I know, because there are so many brands and concentrations out there, I really can't give you a definite number in time, because it really depends on what you purchase. But that will give you a safe amount, and that, as it air dries, comes, it dissipates as well too in that air drying process and then is safe to use. You don't have to rinse off that sanitizer. Correct, you guys have a dishwasher that does the sanitization process. So if you throw it in the dishwasher, it has done its wash, its rinse, and it's sanitized all in that dishwasher. The three compartment, the wash, the rinse, and sanitize is only if you do it manually. That dishwasher is checked. I check it when I come here. I run it. I put a, this one actually is a heat sanitizer, correct? The heat sanitization, which you don't do by hand because you burn your hands, that water in that dishwasher gets up to 180 degrees during its final phase, and it actually kills all the bacteria by heat. So that is that. And so when you let it out, all that steam rises up. You want to let it air dry, and then you can handle it. You don't want to wipe it down because you could be actually adding bacteria to it and fibers to it from the cloth rag. 
and you don't know where that cloth rag was sitting before, or you don't want any pieces of fiber, so I was like, I got something on my tongue from my food because it might have come off that terry cloth or cotton cloth. Did I see a hand over here? About wiping it down? And it does make sense to wipe it down, but you really don't have to at that point. Drip drying and letting it air dry is the best thing that you could do um, because you could potentially add bacteria to it depending on what's on your hands and what's on that cloth, bacterial-wise. If not, it could be a physical contaminant like a piece of cloth that got stuck on there. Even paper towel, same thing. You don't want to necessarily, you don't have to. Why take the extra step? The dishwasher did it. Isn't that why they invented dishwashers? So we don't have to do that extra step, right? So you don't really need to. I mean, it's not as bad as not sanitizing. It's not the worst thing that could happen because there are a lot of more worse things that could happen, but it's one more step that could potentially add a contamination, whether it's a physical contamination by a part of that cloth or a bacterial contamination by our hands or something that got on that cloth. Because depending where that cloth was, like she said, we got people come that come in here that you don't know sometimes. Maybe somebody was in here looking for something else. Oh, I need a spoon. I'm going through all the drawers because I don't know where the spoons are at. I accidentally touched it. I come in here, I don't know where anything's at, but I have to open every single cupboard and drawer when I come in to make sure things are stored properly. They have good construction, no tears, no breaks, no cracks, and make sure it's clean and where you're storing it is clean. Well, when I open it up, dust can fall on those cloths, on those things. I could accidentally touch one because I was looking for something else or I dropped my pen. I mean, anything's possible. Someone could have been looking for something else, opened a drawer, sneezed. You just never know. To give an example, we tell people they cannot preset. If you go to a restaurant and they have their silverware setting out, I would ask for your silverware. If they roll it or cover it, it's different. But you're not supposed to preset silverware so you have the napkin and then the silverware setting on top. Seems harmless, doesn't it? They preset it. Sweet. Don't have to wait for my waitress to come for my silverware. Think of all the little kids that come in with their parents, touching things as they walk by or sneezing. Because let me tell you, as much as I tell my kids, their elbows, it, it doesn't, doesn't always make it there. there. So, and that's why they're not allowed to preset. People think it's just for dust contamination. Well, that's a problem too, but you're not most likely going to get sick from dust. It's all those contamination things that you don't see that could happen. My boss was at a big boy many, many years ago. My boss was at a big boy, did the buffet sale line many years ago because her son's in college now, but he was younger. Went in over there, stuck his finger right in the ranch dressing on the buffet line. No, she, well, being, being a supervisor of the health department, she grabbed it out of the thing, walked it over to the manager and said, you need to change this, my son just stuck his hand in it. Who else would have done that? Exactly, nobody, nobody else probably would have done that. Or you see your kids, or you, I mean, you see kids nowadays too. A lot different from my generation, your generation, let alone the new generation. They grabbing stuff, running all over the place. Parents are just like, either let, leave them be and just let them do run amok. Or they're just like, oh, Billy, stop touching that. Come on. But they never address what the child has done. So these are other things that you look at that why the cloth could add contamination when drying off the pot because not saying little Billy was in here touching your cloth things, but somebody else could have been in there doing something. Because like I said, I come in here. You, don't, you guys don't know what days I've been here. I don't even remember what day I was here last. It was a couple months ago. But... There's different things that could happen in that kitchen while nobody's in there that we might not see. Yes. It's just to dissipate. Now in the um, dish machine, not much because you have a heat sanitizer, but when you have the sanitized um, chemicals, like in a three compartment sink or if your dish machine had that, some of that chemical actually dissipates and comes down to that safer level. Because when you first pull it out, it might be a little too concentrated at that time. But as it air dries, he was asking about why it would um, be okay or not okay to um, have it air dry first if you still used it if it was wet after the sanitized stage. In a hot sanitized thing like that, not as big of a difference because it's going to, it's just better for storage purposes. If you're going to do it immediately, not that big of a deal. But if you're gonna take that pot from your sanitized stage of your dish machine and then put it on a shelf for storage, then you're getting a storage issue where it's dripping onto other things, it's causing a mess, it's making the facility not clean, 
which over time can add to other problems and stuff too because you get drip marks and staining on the walls and it adds to moisture content issues and things of that um, which I'm not getting into the construction and type of stuff today but if you're having a chemical sanitizer it's more important and imperative to let it air dry because it makes sure that you're doing that final phase because there's actually four phases of dishwashing actually they say five pre-wash washing rinsing sanitizing and air drying and that air drying allows that some that chemical sanitizer to be at that level that's safe for use yes No, you do not need to have goggles. She, he was asking about the sixth phase of putting everything away. This is where you should start with clean hands. Washing them properly is that key phase of that. You don't need gloves because gloves are only required for touching a ready-to-eat food once it's ready to be consumed by a person. But washing dishes, you have dirty hands and then you're putting away the clean dishes. Well, you just touched all this food and utensils that had all this chewed food and leftovers and whatever else on it that's been sitting on a plate for who knows how long, you scrape it, you put it in, well now you're pulling out a rack of clean dishes. Well did you wash your hands? Because you got all this dried food debris and germs from the dirty dishes and now you're touching the clean dishes. So as long as you use that 20 second rule, you can go ahead and put those utensils and equipment away. Don't grab them by the fork end, grab it by the handle end. I mean if you did, if you washed your hands properly, the possibility of contaminating is lessened by touching on the fork end but it's better if you grab it by the handle end. So just taking these things, that's a good question actually because we don't want to touch those things. And that's why we do the hygiene and making sure we always wash our hands between different practices helps us to prepare for those times when we weren't thinking. So if we're always constantly washing our hands and we missed a step of contamination, we really didn't miss it because we're always washing our hands. And we safeguarded ourselves and we safeguarded the people that we're serving. Thought I another hand. If it's already been on the shelf and cleaned, and it's in the crop, he was asking about, do you have to clean something that's already been cleaned? So for example, all your equipment, I'm sorry. No, that's not acceptable. He was asking if you um, had a pot of green beans, you, you served them, but you needed that pot for green beans. Again, can you just wash it with soap, rinse it, and then just put it back into use? No, because that's actually what happened with that custard thing. And even though it's green beans and it seems simple, spinach seemed innocent too, didn't it? So we just never know, and taking the extra precaution, the extra 60 seconds to let it immerse in that sanitizer would, or, and with you guys having the dish machine, it actually makes it a lot easier because you don't have to wait as long. I think it's like a 90 second cycle that the whole thing goes through. And so it really makes it really fast and immediate for use. That's where you would use the three compartment sink and let it air dry afterwards. You may want to get a secondary pan for that to have a backup, or you may just want to, if you can wait otherwise, maybe get a bigger pan so you can cook more green beans at one time, but you do want to do that sanitized compartment because in case that first bag of green beans was contaminated, you want to take it over to the second bag, bag of green beans. We're always trying to minimize the possibility of contamination. Yes. To wash them, I would put handles down because you want the food contact surface up because it gets the debris and sanitizes better. Do you guys have the cup things that you put them in? Then you take that cup and you flip it upside down and put it in another cup. Then you have all your handles exposed. So you take your two, it'd be like taking. Sorry, I'm really bad with microphones too. Washer cups like this, the beer wash cup fork ends up. When you're done, you put fork in. You got it washed, put this over there, flip it, and now you have handles up. Would be the best way to do it that way. If you have a cupped thing that way, otherwise, make sure you wash your, if you can't dump them because of how many there are, depending on the size of the buckets, making sure you wash your hands with that 20 second rule will allow you to grab them out of there. 
So you can touch silverware with your bare hands. It's that 20 second hand washing rule that we talked about that's imperative to make sure that that happens. So you don't necessarily want to grab the forks if you don't have to with your bare hands, but if you're getting them on the dish machine and you can't dump them into something else easily, make sure you wash your hands very thoroughly. And watch out ladies, men with rings, think of all this crud that gets, lotion that gets stuck up in there, food that gets stuck up in there. I actually don't wear my wedding ring at work anymore. Well, one, it's my eczema because water gets trapped under it. But think of all the water that gets trapped under it. There's a bacteria that's actually under there, stuck in the moisture that's affecting my hands. So think of all the other things that you have in there. So when you wash your hands, keep that in mind as well too. Jewelry is very important. Yep, yep, the three compartment sink, sink, there's actually five steps. So it would be pre-wash, if you can, you don't have to. Pre-wash or pre-scraping is what they call it, getting the actual remainder of the foods off. This is proper usage of washing, rinsing, and then sanitizing manually by hand. So the first step is scraping or rinsing if you have an overhead sprayer. Washing in the soapy Dawn dish detergent if you want to use the antimicrobial. Not required, but you can. I like Dawn because it's a grease cutter. I use it on my laundry too. Second one would be a warm, clean rinse water. The third step would be the proper sanitizer amount, whatever it says on the back of your sanitizer. And then the, the final step would be the air drying until it's properly air dried and then you can put it away. Because you don't want it to contaminate anything else, you don't want it to mess up your floors, you don't want it to ruin the walls, things of that nature. When the water becomes murky or cold, is time to change the water yes when you're time to change it or if your concentration level you should there should be there's actually test strips that they have on hand to check that concentration in that sanitized compartment so anytime you're below that level dump it and get a new batch and it should all be warm water too so when your water starts getting cold or murky change it if your clean clear water in the center compartment becomes murky dump it and make some fresh water it should be something that's changed if you're doing a whole bunch of dishes in a row you may want to check after an hour or so. But here, there's so much that you can put through there. You're not doing them that often. You could probably get through all of your dishes in one batch, depending on how soiled they were ahead of time. Correct. It's just warm, it's warm water, not hot water. You don't want it too hot that, first of all, you can't put your hands in it because that's going to prevent you from properly getting them in there. But yes, if the water is too hot, it counteracts sanitizer. So actually warm water anywhere, again, it'll actually tell you on the back of the, the package, but about 70 to 100 degrees is really all you need. Something that's just above, you know, something you take a bath in, think of it that way. You don't want it scalding hot. The scalding hot water is what comes out when you do the dishwasher. You don't want that. All you need is something that's above room temperature, that's warm. Like I, I tell people, think of a bath water. It's comfortable enough to put your hands in, but you know it's warm enough that it's making the dishes. So you want the stuff to be able to dissolve off the dishes and the concentration of the um, sanitizer to work properly. No, you can, no, if you have, no, you can do a spray rinse too. Just turn the faucet on if that works too, as long as that gets that soap off of there. Because you're, you're, what you're doing is you want the soap suds off so it doesn't get into your sanitized compartment because detergent counteracts the sanitizer. It actually make, the soap will actually make the sanitizer less and it won't work as well. He was asking if you could do a spray rinse instead of doing a clean water bath. So you could do the soapy warm water, spray rinse it from the faucet or overhead sprayer that is acceptable, and then you can put it into the sanitized compartment. If you're going that, I would still recommend it, but since it's technically within a certain amount of time, if you're going immediately from that green beans and you're going immediately to a second batch, um, technically you can. I would recommend to sanitize, depending on what happens on that and the reheating aspect of it and the time lag between it, really depends on how often to do that. Are they, are they, are they come, come from, from a can, can you said? Um, it's, I, 
I don't know how deep you guys want me to go. Technically, it's re. I know. Technically, it's a reheat. It's reheating, and so it's reheating for immediate service. So there's really no temperature on it. So because you're doing it for immediate. New. Right. I, I would recommend against it, and I'd have to see, like, because there's lots of factors to take into account. What kind? Got to watch roasting pans, too, because those aren't approved for service. Because they, they have the, unless you have a liner pan in them. Um, roasting pans are not approved because of the ceramic liner that's in them. The coating that comes on them is not approved for food contact. I know, they're crockpots and stuff like that. In a commercial kitchen, they're not approved. So things that we, you know all those black and white speckled roasting pans growing up? I ate them all the time. Antimony poisoning. So, but we're all sitting here though, aren't we though? But you can't use it in a commercial kitchen. So, and that's where I would do that. Yes, for the green beans, I would recommend getting a new pot because because it minimizes your concentration. It minimizes the possibility of it being contaminated because you're assuming that whoever dumped the green beans had a clean can or had clean hands when they dumped it. Was the ladle that they used cleaned? Things of that nature. So you do really want to be cautious. And the more protection we have, the better. So if you can wash, rinse, and sanitize it between uses, it is a better practice. How long did it take you to heat up those green beans? How long will it take up to heat the new green beans? Was the green beans? safe to begin with. I mean, there's lots of factors. So wash, rinsing, and sanitizing is really a short step when it comes down to it. It takes you less than 90 seconds really to do the whole process. So to take that extra measure, it wouldn't be, it doesn't hurt. Do you really want to know that answer? A lot, actually, because at a restaurant, that oil stays in a deep fryer for quite a long time because of the heat. It comes down to a cleanliness and how fresh that oil is, basically. So if you're here for a fish fry, as long as that is still heated and you're using it all night, you can still use that same oil all night for your fish fry. What, 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 what kind of deep fryer do you guys have? Like a commercial deep fryer? Technically you can, they don't necessarily drain it every time. It goes on hot, because it gets so hot. That's why I always tell people that people say they get sick from Chinese food. Chinese food gets so hot that it kills almost everything off of it. I'm not saying you can't get sick from Chinese food, I'm not saying that, but people always assume it's, but because they fry everything or they deep fry their egg rolls, everything gets so scalding hot and that's basically what a fryer does. So actually, you don't have to change the oil necessarily every time, but you do want to make sure that it's clean oil. So if you have lots of debris from the fish fry the week before, you're going to want to drain it and put new oil in. You have to really look at the oil and the cleanliness. Really is what it comes down to. They are asking about reusing the deep fryer oil from fish fry to fish fry. It really comes, since you have a commercial one, not just one of those tabletop, Foreman, whatever they or whatever they call them, the little tabletop ones you can do in it. That doesn't count. These commercial deep fryers get to such a high. 350 to 375. The hottest food you have to cook is 165 degrees. So that gives you an indication of how hot those fryers get. So as long as the oil itself is clean and the fryer is clean, you guys don't use it that often, so it should in theory be pretty clean. And I'm talking about places that fry food all day, every day, they still sometimes carry it over to the next day, or even two days. Because, 
some depending on what they're cooking and how often they cook in it. Some fry, some places have a fryer where they cook everything in it. Some places have, well, I, this is my French fry fryer, this is my chicken fryer, and this is my fish fryer. So it really comes down onto the cleanliness of the food, which is your oil, because it's your cooking food, and the machine itself, the actual fryer itself. So, yeah, I forgot who asked me that question, but yes, you can reuse the oil in the fryer, depending on cleanliness. As a vegetarian, I would love it if you did that, but it's not required. She was asking if you have to have a separate fryer for fish and french fries for allergies. At this time, they are not requiring anybody to do allergen things in that manner. You just have to be aware that people have allergies and how to react to them and to notify them in that manner. As a vegetarian, I can taste it when they use a fish fryer for my french fries. Because I can taste it in the oil, I can taste it in my french fries. So there is no requirement that you have to have separate fryers for different foods, but you may want to let people know if you have a fish allergy, I would post it and say, may contain peanuts, may contain fish oils, may be contaminated, you know, may have, you know, you see it almost on every food, may, in a facility that also does peanuts type of a thing. Even though that food has no peanuts in it, they're letting you know that they cannot guarantee a peanut did not get in there from something, or that the oils from peanuts did not get in there from something. So it's not required, but it is um, something to be thinking about. You do keep yours separate? Okay, then that's, and that's perfect. It actually makes your french fries taste better. So thank you, I'll come to your fish fry. No, no fish french fry for me. <laughs> For the servers, again, we're talking about hygiene. You want to make sure your hands are clean. Um, you should be gloves. If you're touching, or you don't have to have gloves, but at least some kind of serving. If you're not using a glove, it should be some kind of spatula, ladle, deli wax paper. Your hand cannot touch any food that's going out to the people. Effective hair restraints which is a hat, hair net, and a bandana, is required for people prepping food and cooking food. Serving food is not required. However, as a bartender and waitress, I always pull my hair back because even though I'm not cooking it or serving it, I got long hair, hair flies around, we all lose our hair, us ladies too, which really stinks. But you, I mean, keeping it pulled back, um, actually when I first started, when I first, uh, oh, I heard that. Actually, there is a beard restraint too. If you, ha my husband has a full beard that comes down to here that people think he's Amish all the time. And if he worked in the food industry, he would actually have to wear a beard net. Um, if you ever go to Morley Candies Factory, there's a gentleman there that has a full beard, and you will see him on the food line wearing his food net or his beard net for the food. So at the cooking line, or at the serving line, you're not required to. Although be conscious about it. If you have long hair, you don't want to be serving food and leaning over and stuff like that. You might want to have it pulled back and things of that nature. Think of it. When I first started, hairspray was considered an effective hair restraint. They, I know. As, as long as you had enough hairspray, they considered it an effective hair restraint. Those were back in the days when Aquanet was going off the shelves like nobody's business. Exactly, a little extra texture. So you do want to be conscious of that. So hats aren't necessarily required. You don't want people coming back using the same plate because they should be getting a fresh plate every time they come back. Because what happens is, if they bring up their dirty plate with their food on it, first of all, you don't know what they did on their plate. I've had, pe you've, you've seen people eat in public. They spit things back on their plate. They got dried food on their plate. They got meat on their plate. They got salad on their plate. They come up and they're taking a serving utensil and putting more on that same plate. Well, that spoon may have now just touched their plate. So whatever was stuck to their plate is now going back in that batch of green beans or back in the salad bowl. So you want them to start with a fresh, clean plate every time they come up. If it is, is this Do you guys serve it to the people? Okay. So you want to make sure you're giving them a fresh plate every time they come up because you don't want to make that serving spoon that you're using come in contact with their dirty plate and then go back into the pan that you're serving from. Um, on a buffet, technically a sneeze guard is required. 
How many people you see sneeze or cough when they come up? Oh, I have. All the time. I see people do it all When I'm out to eat, I see people do it all the time. Well, that disperses. When you sneeze or cough, it's not just this little funnel that comes out. It's a big dispersal. It disperses in a big pattern. Anything of that nature could happen. What if someone with the flu going around? Someone's in line, they feel fine. All of a sudden, they get up there like, oh, man, I don't feel so, and they get sick. Hopefully, we'll just scratch the whole thing at that point. But my point being is things, there's a, it's airborne at that point. Things disperse in the air. It floats around. It gets into food. So having like a sneeze guard or protective barrier for the general public would be best. Or keeping it maybe behind on that center column. You guys have that center island in there. You could serve from that and then give them the plate at the window. That way you don't have to worry about them coming up and sneezing on the food. That way the people that are trained to be in the kitchen know the proper procedures. Because you're assuming that Joe Schmo public coming up is going to be clean and stuff. No, they're bringing their germs too. They share them over. Yeah. For ice itself? Yes, ice is considered a food. Um, it seems silly, but ice is a food. It goes into your drink, it melts, you drink it. So just as water from the tap is considered a food. Food is not meat and potatoes. And it's, food is a consumable product. So it's candy, it's drinks, it's ice, it's juices, it's food, it's desserts, it's everything. Anything you can put in your mouth, it's considered a food in the restaurant industry. So making sure that you're not touching things with your bare hands. Picking a glass up. Don't serve someone a glass like this. You just put your fingers all over their mouth area. Holding a cup would be like this so that you're not touching where the food area is, where their mouths are going to be coming in contact with. Don't scoop ice with a cup or a glass. Two reasons. One, your hand can now become in contact with that ice because it's a small scoop you're using. Second of all, this could, this could break. You now have to empty your ice machine completely because if a glass or cup breaks in your ice machine, you now have a physical contaminant you can't find. Even if you see, oh, here's the piece, you don't know that. Glass, clear plastic, those things could really hurt somebody if they were to swallow that because it actually cuts through their stomachs, through their digestive tracts, and makes them internally bleed. So you have to be, I've broke, as a bartender, I bartended for 20 something years. I've done plenty of, and our, the reason I had to do this is because our glasses are stored over our ice bin at the old restaurant, and I don't know why. How many times you go to put one up, it falls back off, smashes right into my ice bin. Get buckets and buckets of hot water. I have to melt every single bit of ice in there to wash, rinse, and sanitize that bottom and make sure it drains out the plug and there's no contaminants in there anymore to fill it back up again. In theory, you don't have to unless it becomes contaminated. The one area you do want to, because people think that ice, you want to know how often you have to clean it and wash it and sanitize it. It's a continually in use thing. I would recommend it twice a year, at least. Just because it is a form of contamination. And as much as you don't think ice can cont be contaminated, there's what we call a splash guard. So as soon as you open up your ice bin, you see, I think yours is plastic. A little, it's called a splash guard that everything kind of keeps the ice at bay so it doesn't all roll out. You'll see either a pink line or a black line at the bottom of that splash guard. Pink means it's a yeast growing. Black means there's a mold growing. Ew, exactly. Because people don't realize that the water coming in has minerals. You're bringing in tap water. That's all that goes in there. Some people have well water that has minerals coming in. There's, they add stuff to the water when it comes to your house and to the church. These can have things that picks up in the pipeline along the way. So making sure that the areas inside that you can see are clean. Um, actually, if you, during that cleaning twice a year, take the panel off the top. You'll see some uh, bacteria, you'll see some mold growing in there too.
because it, as it comes in and splashes around, and there's also air in there. The air carries tons of bacteria and contaminants with it. And, as it, and water is a food that bacteria can feed off of. It can start growing and growing, and that's or a yeast, and it can start. Yeast is also, you can find it on jellies. If you get, had a jelly in your refrigerator a long time, it's got that slimy stuff on top. That's a yeast. So you want to make sure that that's um, something that you look at, too. It is a food, and it can come become contaminated. Um, a sanitized rag on that splash guard, you want to make sure that you, if you're starting to see that on there, melt some of the ice down. Get a, don't let your rag be dripping, but get a nice sanitized rag in there and wipe down that area to clean it up. You could, but being properly educated about that, would you guys want any waitress coming to your table with your glass like this? Even, yeah, just, you don't want anyone touch, I mean, organize them and stack them. It is some, if you're gonna be stacking them, it might be easier so you don't have to worry about it. Just make sure it's a fresh pair of gloves that has not been contaminated. This is the best way so you know you're not touching anything and your gloves aren't contaminated. But if you're in a hurry and you're doing a lot, especially at a wake or something like that where you have lots of people that are just, or even at the fish fry, people just coming up and grabbing, you're trying to keep the station filled at all, throw a pair of gloves on. It's not that hard to have them on. Just, you know, so that way it makes it easier. You can grab the tops of them. A lot of people may not still like that. Even with gloves on, people are like, oh, they touched my hand or their hands on my cup. So it's a perception thing sometimes too. You know, how the public sees you. Because you are, again, are in the food service industry. As volunteers, you're helping out and you're the face of this church when it comes to these things. So all the other parishioners look to you guys when they come in. Technically, you can, as long as the handle is sticking out. But you have to be cautious because if you leave it in there too long, it becomes buried. You can't find it and you're digging through the ice. Or if you don't stick it in, like you have to actually jam it in so it's sticking up. The preferable place is on a clean, dry surface. They actually have scoop holders that mount to the wall. He was asking about leaving the scoop in the ice bin. It's not the best place. Technically, you can if you do it properly. Properly is the key word here. You don't want that handle in contact with the ice because then you're digging around looking for the handle well now you just contaminated the ice with your hands so you want to make sure that it's in a clean dry location would be the best thing and actually they I, you guys don't have them so they can hang it right on the side and that is a better place so that way you also watching where it hangs you don't want people brushing up next to it so if it's in a, a pathway area that's not a good spot either so getting some place where it's not going to be contaminated by someone walking by or rubbing up against it, or from other contaminants, if there's like a hand sink right next to it, you don't want it there because as people wash their hands, the water could be spraying the scoop as well too. So a clean, dry surface with the handle extended is the best practice for storing any utensil. Yep, storing a cup would be best like this, so that way you're grabbing the bottom end of it. So you got them like that, you just pick it up and you can fill it up for somebody. So he was asking about how to store a cup. Plus, as it air dry, having it upside down helps it air dry better. You can get one of those um, mesh nettings. You see them in all the stores. It's like a rubber mat for lining different kitchen areas. It actually helps it air dry better. So now it's, it's got that little bit of air flow under it, and it'll help prevent it from sticking to anything and gets any moisture that's left in there as well, too. Thought I saw another hand over here. Oh, yes, here. Because she was asking about the sleeves of cups coming out and how the whole sleeve is set up like this. And she was also asking about having a hairnet for serving food or for serving, for putting together a beverage. Um, for the sleeves, I would recommend instead of setting the whole sleeve up like this, you're right. What they do is to get a cup out, they're grabbing the lip of every cup. And what happens is because they're so tight up against each other. So here's my two cups. 
I can try to cautiously grab this one, but now I'm touching the second cup already as I'm trying to get them to unsuction from each other. So actually, if you have your sleeves flipped upside down, I'm only touching the one cup I'm using. So having the lid down is better. And for the hair restraints, because beverages are considered minimal food prep, you don't have to if you're just doing beverages. I always check a pot machine before I use it. There isn't anything about refilling in that manner, unfortunately. About she's talking about reservice, refilling your own beverage at a self-serve thing when you go to the restaurants and you can refill your own beverage. The lip portion has now touched that chute, the release mechanism, which is very true. How many tens of thousands of people have touched it before you? It is something to be concerned about, even when you go out. These are things you guys are going to find yourself going to restaurants looking at things now, just so you guys know. When I first started in food. We'd walk into some place that I didn't even expect. I'm like, okay, honey, we got to go. He's like, what do you mean we got to go? I'm like, we got to go. I'm like, and one night he pleaded and begged with me. He's like, honey, just please close your eyes. I'm starving. Just don't look at anything. So I did. I had to have my face away from the kitchen because they have the windows, and that's what you do as an inspector. You start looking at things. When you become more aware of these things, you're going to notice your surface. You go, ooh, that waitress just did that. I can't believe she just touched the glass like that. Honey, did you know that that wasn't right? And you're going to notice these things more because now you're going to be more conscious of them. But yes, even storing the cups, as simple as that, you don't want them to have to do that. Or even when you go out to drink or to refill your beverages, you may want to use your finger, which is what I do when I go out now. Instead of taking my cup and pushing that release mechanism to refill your beverage, just take your finger and touch the bottom part of it and just hold your cup there. I do that because I don't know when the last time they washed them was. We do look at those when we go, but we look for physical. I can't see bacteria with my bare eyes. So as much as they may look physically clean to me and there's no bacteria or mold or anything growing when I go inspect them, it doesn't mean that there couldn't be bacterial contaminations there. And they should be washed because that is an area that needs to be sanitized as well too. I do. When I they should be. Well, if you're, she was asking about clearing off a table and washing your hands. If you guys are clearing the tables, and that's all you're doing, if you're go, coming here, getting dirty dishes and putting them in the back, coming and getting dirty dishes and putting them in the back, don't need to wash them until you're completely done. However, if you're coming out, getting dirty dishes, taking them back, and then doing something else, before you do that something else, you should be washing your hands because you don't know what's been on that plate. You don't know what those people have done to their food on the plate. I told you, I, I, won't, I won't tell you a story. You don't wanna know what people do on these plates sometimes. So you, if you're taking a dirty dish back and you're cleaning the tables and then you're doing something else besides touching more dirty dishes, you should, even touching your own face or anything, you should be washing your hands properly with that 20 second hand washing rule. Done with the food ice. Oh, one more question over here. She was asking about the kids that come in and help you clear the plates and then reset the placemats. They don't have to have gloves because you can touch utensils and equipment with your bare hands, but they should be washed because you're going from a dirty product to a clean product. So anytime you go from a dirty product to a clean product or change your job, so clearing dirty and placing new is considered a different job, you should be washing and having them washing their hands in between those two, yes.
See, now you're starting to think like a health inspector. She's just talking about different types of contaminations when you go. I mean, the menus will be dirty, the salt and pepper shakers. You can cross-contaminate many different ways. So just keeping those things in mind and washing your hands is important. But she brought up a good point about hand washing is when you go to wash your hands, you guys have electric dryers here, which is good. But think of a paper towel dispenser. Well, you just washed your hands. Well, who touched it before? Did they wash them before or after they touched that paper towel dispenser? Using your elbow to dispense it or dispensing it before you wash is good because then you can just rip the paper towel off and then you know you got clean paper towel to dry your hands with. I don't touch a bathroom door handle to save my life. Even my kids are seven and nine and they're oh, don't touch, the, oh mom, we know, don't touch the door handle. Because there are people that don't wash their hands. Don't ever touch a bathroom door handle. As soon as you touch it, you just, exactly, as soon as you touch it, your hands are not washed. Yep, okay. All right, um, we had a couple questions too. One was about refreezing meat. If we have a raw meat, I'm sorry, if that was frozen, is refrigerated. There's only a couple ways to thaw a raw meat. In the refrigerator, from freezer to refrigerator, under cold running water, or part of the cooking process. That means you take it from the freezer, you put it right in the oven or the pan or the microwave. Those are the only ways. I know everyone probably here has put a chicken breast on their counter and let it thaw there all day. My mother-in-law still does it. I go over there and cringe every time I see it. But you can't do that because what happens is the center stays frozen while the outside is thawing. And so we get different temperatures and the outside starts getting bacteria. However, you can refreeze that meat. It can be refrozen within a certain amount of time. I don't have an answer to that certain amount of time because it depends on how it was held and what temperature and what food it is. But you don't want to have something frozen, then thawed, have it for a week, two weeks, and then refreeze it. Because the freshness is going to be bad. But if you get something from the market, you said that it was, it was frozen in the morning, thawed, you can take it home and refreeze it. There, yes, within a couple days, you can refreeze that meat. That is not a problem at all. Um, yes, gentlemen. That is exactly what I'm talking about. He was asking about thawing the fish, the box of frozen fish the night before from your freezer and sticking it into the refrigerator. That is exactly what you want to do. On the bottom shelf and away from all other foods. Raw meat must be stored separate and away from all other foods. On the bottom shelf. If you have multiple different types of, fro of raw meat, it would go chicken, beef, then fish. Chicken would be on the bottom because it has the highest cooking temperature required. Beef would be your next one because that's the next highest temperature. And then fish would be your least amount of heat. So you want to do it by cooking temperature if you have more than one kind of raw meat. Otherwise, you don't want raw meat other, over any other food. I would recommend at the end of end of every day that you use them because that syrup will one promote bugs because in the summertime you will get fruit flies but also because we're talking about the multiple service and cups going to it you can get bacterial contamination so just taking a sanitized rag at the end of the night would be perfect you can if they're removable you can take them out wash rinse and sanitize them yeah some of them are not removable but if they're removable you can take them right on off If it's in the packaging, it does not have to be sanitized. If it's in the box, it does not have to be. She was asking if you had to sanitize the refrigerator after you took the raw fish out. If you see that it was visibly dripping, obviously I would wash, I would wash and sanitize it then in case something else came in contact with it. You're not required to, but it's general cleanliness that we're talking about. So if you're seeing a visible dripping or oversplash or something, then you can get in there and wash it. I would recommend sanitizing it too not required to be sanitized because it's not considered a food contact surface. It's a non-food contact surface because you're storing food in it, but the food is in a box. So, that's also packaged. 
think of all the stuff in your refrigerator. It's either in a Tupperware, uh, something of that nature. And if it's vegetables, they should be washed before you use them anyway. So, and it shouldn't be on the bottom shelf because you're going to have raw meat there anyway. Um, also, we have um, another question about expiration dates. When you have a food that has a date on it, that is a freshness date. That means nothing else. The date that comes on milk, once you open that milk, means nothing. Once you open up sour cream, that date means nothing. Once you open up a package of deli meat, that date means nothing. You now have seven days from the day that you open it to use that product. Because it adds bacteria to it. It has been packaged in a certain manner that is preventing any bacteria or any other additives from getting into it. I will give you a good example. Say you bought a gallon of milk today. What's today? The 16th? Today is the 16th. So say you bought a gallon of milk today and it says February 3rd on it. Sweet. I got till February 3rd. I'm going on vacation. I come back. It's February 1st. You can still use that because you have not opened it. It's, it's still intact, and, and that, that freshness freshman state is still being maintained. However, you bought the gallon of milk today, it says February 3rd on it. I'm going to have a glass of milk, bowl of cereal, some porridge. Then I'm going on vacation. Yeah, I have porridge. I was brought in there. Um, but you, take a, you open that milk, use a little bit out of it, put it back in your fridge, then you go on vacation. You come back February 1st. Well, the date says February 3rd on it. I bet you that milk's going to taste very yucky because now you... Now you have added actually bacteria to it, which has now changed that date. It's no longer a freshness date that we're worried about now. It's a use-by date. So once you open, it's something we call a potentially hazardous food. Something that needs to be refrigerated is the basic concept of a potentially hazardous food. That means it has enough food, oxygen, and moisture for bacteria to grow. Once you add that bacteria in it and give it some time, which is about seven days, that bacteria starts rapidly growing and can make someone ill. So once you open a product like that, we're even talking whipped cream. Ready whip? It's an air exchange. Seven days. That means adding six days to the day that you opened it. So today's the 16th. I would put January 22nd on it, and if it's not used by the end of the day on January 22nd, it has to be thrown out. Yes. Condiments are commercially packaged and made with a whole bunch of stuff in it to make it not potentially hazardous. And it actually will say need no refrigeration on it. Refrigeration for like mustards and ketchups is mostly just for a preference for consumers. She was asking about condiments. Commercially packaged are um, a lot of the big dressing tubs and things that you get um, are made with so much sodium in it or so much preservatives in it that they are not required to be refrigerated. They're made so you don't have to worry about that. Homemade ranch dressing, no. Well, it depends on the kind, but most of them, if it's commercially, well, yeah, and that's for, it'll go in the refrigerator, but does not have that seven days on it. Well, we're talking, yes. Yes, the dress, well, it's like, most of the dressings you will put it in the refrigerator afterwards, but you don't have to put that seven day date on it. Mustard and ketchup, you don't have to, but it's going to be better quality if you refrigerate it. But if it's commercially, if it's commercially, commercially prepared and packaged on a condiment or dressing, that seven-day rule does not apply. If you make your own dressings, you take the sour cream and the ranch dressing pack and mix it up, which is the best way to have ranch dressing, if you ask me, that has a seven-day hold time on it, no more. He was asking about the dates on cans, the biggest controversy in food, I'm telling you. They will tell you that it's no longer good after that. That is not true. It is a fresh mistake. It may not taste as good as the day one when they packaged it, but it is still edible, as long as the integrity of the package is good. So you want no dents, no seams done, no bulging. If you see a bulging can, please don't open it. Throw it away. And you laugh, but we do emergency, I'll give you another example. We do emergency call systems. I have to respond to fires after work. If there's a restaurant fire, I have to go out. I received a call from a homeowner, which we're not supposed to get from homeowners. It's supposed to be from the police or fire department. Wants to know if he has to go to the emergency room because they, opened, they had a can of spaghetti sauce that was bulging. And we're talking a can. You see a can bulging, you're already kind of an indicator already. Not to these people. 
They opened the can, which then exploded, sauce everywhere, and they want to know if they should take their nine-month-old child to the emergency room. I said, I don't think that there should be a cause for alarm here. It just got, well, we're concerned, and we called the CDC, and they said, I go, well, a little, the little that may have gotten on your child's lips from the explosion is, I go, if you want to be cautious, you can go, but it's really not needed. It. Oh, but we cooked with it and ate it afterwards. So the bulging can didn't give them a, a good enough reason not to eat it. The exploding as they opened it didn't give them enough reason. After they ate it, then the recollection came and said, hey, maybe we shouldn't have ate that. I said, yes, get to the emergency room now, please. There is none because the consumer packaging company will tell you that you should use the fresh estate. She's wondering if there's a rule of thumb. There is none. We, say, we, tell, peop we tell people about a year. It doesn't mean it's bad after a year, but really the quality of the packaging, of the quality of the food goes down after that because it's sitting in some kind of juice or water, which really starts breaking down the food after a certain point. So the quality, would you get sick from it? No, would you like it? Probably not either. So we tell people, you know, we can't really tell you how long to go, but on standard, I mean, if you ate it a year afterwards, it's not gonna hurt you. Um, as a soup kitchen, because you, you guys aren't a, she wanted to know if you guys are legally allowed to give those out. I can't get the legality of it because you guys are not a, like a Kroger store. But as a soup kitchen, I don't know what those rules are in that, so I don't want to even go to that part. Yeah. In a commercial kitchen, you cannot use a food packaging system. If you want to use it in your own home, I would be cautious with it and be careful. Make sure your hands are cleaned and sanitized. But in a commercial kitchen, you can't use those at all. Um, yes. Like the Ready Whip are you talking about? Cheese Whiz? Ready Whip has a, once you use it, it's seven days. Because there's actually an air exchange. When the nitrous puts that ready whip out, that whipped cream out, there's actually an air exchange that happens. And so actually, once you use it, it's seven days. Same thing, seven days. Well, cheese was is kind of like Velveeta, where you can sit on a shelf all day long. So that one's almost packaged to the point where it's got so many preservatives in it that it's not required. But something like ready whip, where it's a dairy, that's where you would have to. Cheese Whiz really isn't cheese, just like Velveeta is not really cheese. And um, transferring, I had a question too about transferring syrup from one bottle to another. Marrying foods isn't the best scenario. Um, you want to put them in, you can marry the two foods. It also depends kind of on what kind of syrup is and where, if, it's, if the syrup's been on the table and you have a half bottle here and you got a bottle in the back, you don't know who's been touching that bottle. I've seen people take a ketchup bottle, this is the top of it, and shake it up at the table. Well, where the heck have their hands been? Is that the guy that doesn't wash them when he goes to the bathroom? So when you combine syrups or ketchups or mustards, you got to be really thinking about where it's come from first. You should be just letting the product go out in that syrup container and then just using the fresh one when it's ready to go so you can wash, rinse, and sanitize that bottle properly. Do we have I want to thank you, Karen. I'm sure we probably could have listened to a lot more, um, but thank you for coming out. And I'm sure as co questions come up, they, um, Macomb County Health Department under Environmental Services, is that what it's called, uh, is the phone number there, and you can email to them also. And I, I, maybe I'm assuming you can email questions if you have them. Um, last night I took this book. This is the book that uh, Tim gave me from the class that he took and it really didn't take that long to get through I don't know if we can purchase more th these books for okay but we may get a couple just if anyone's interested in looking at because well first of all after I read through the botulism and all the uh, I thought oh why are we even cooking any food here it's kind of scary yet we've been very fortunate we serve thousands and thousands of people with very few incidences but there is a couple things that we want to touch base on because of things that have happened here. Um, for example, when we have soups, 
you're making sauces or anything in a large container, you can't use a Home Depot container. You have to use a uh, properly s certified food container that says health department. We actually have a situation where we have those plastic containers that people put money in for coffee and donuts, and someone actually took that and put orange juice in it and put it in the refrigerator. So don't save us any orange juice or anything left over. Pour it out because, honestly, no one is going to go in there and uncover a pitcher with plastic on it and drink it. So just pour it out. Just try not to uh, put fill up the container if you think we're not going to go that far. Another situation is, you know, with the pop machine, sometimes we've had people change the syrup because we ran out. Most of the time now we're going to have someone on staff here, but one time someone hooked up a regular Coke instead of the Diet Coke. A diabetic thought she was getting diet and got um, regular, and it shot up her uh, sugar. So. Make, if you're going to do something, try to get staff, make sure you know what you're doing. We've had some issues with um, our CO2 tank going out, so if you don't know how to hook it up, please make sure you contact someone uh, to make sure. We have a lot of kids with peanut allergies. We have some kids that come here with their EpiPens for religious ed, just in case it's even in here. Um, we have someone on staff that has a fish allergy. So it's really important that you clean even before you come in, because Lisa's great at cleaning, but like we said, we've had people walk in, and we walk into the kitchen, it's been clean, and we find stuff all over the floor. There's drippings because people went and got coffee or uh, pop, or I've seen people sitting on the counter. So you really don't want to start cooking and cutting food if someone's been sitting on, on the counter. So just keep those type of things in mind. There's no way that we can prevent any everything from happen, happening, and we want, don't want to get so germ conscious or so afraid that we're, you know, because we can't prevent everything. But we just want to kind of bring it to your attention and make sure you understand. And, you know, when we have volunteers coming in, if we have a lot of people who've never volunteered before. We want people to volunteer. But like with the fish fries, if you see, you know, when these kids come in, if they come in coughing and they got to get the community service done, so they're coming no matter what, they shouldn't be here. So if you're in a leadership position, please make sure that you say, sorry, hon, but you, you know, you really need to leave. We can't, we can't have that. So um, I know we probably last stayed a little bit longer than what was intended. Um, just remember, too, when you're planning an event in here, you've got something. We do have forms that we need you to fill out. We uh, Sometimes people say, oh, I don't need it. I'm going to set it up. But if you're having a, an event, we need to know if there's going to be 10 people here or a couple hundred people here because the staff um, scheduling depends on that. If you cancel an event, things change, let us know. Um, Lisa, did you have anything in particular you wanted to... Yeah, some key points to keep everything in mind. We are going to get little stickers and have them available. So if you put food in and you think, oh, okay, well, we're going to save this for two days from now, or, oh, we'll leave it so the staff or somebody can have it. For, we don't know if it's intended for you, when it's going to be there for, how long it's been there sometimes. So pretty much on Wednesdays now, if there's stuff left in the refrigerator, it's getting thrown out unless it's marked. 
Um, because sometimes people don't seal things up very well either when they, you know, they just kind of stick it in the refrigerator because they're in a hurry to go to move on to go home or do whatever else that's going on. So, um, any other? And isn't there a sink that's specific for hand washing? You want to tell them? And also for sanitizing items, do we have like spray bottles for them? And where are those? Yes, Diane. Yes. Okay, we do usually have one in the office as well, but we maybe should still have one if the office isn't open. Yeah. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to e email, call, whatever. Uh, we really appreciate all the time and energy you put into this. I, like I said before, I don't want to scare anyone away. We just want to make sure that we don't hurt anybody by just not thinking things through. So again, thank you for coming today. And yes, Bernie? Um, no, <laughs> no, I don't think we need one, but um, all of you, you know, there's some people that are in different ministries. I know there's people here from hospitality, the Knights of Columbus, funeral luncheons, all different aspects. You know, just don't share your information or your knowledge, but don't scare any, anyone. We still want people to use our hall and stuff. We just want to make sure we're safe and protected. So, yes, Bob. Oh, yes. We did videotape this. Hopefully it came out pretty well. So, Because I know there were some people that couldn't come during the day, so we'll kind of review it. and Maybe if we need to, if you need to show it to anyone, hopefully it will be available. I'll let you know. So thank you, and have a great day.